Mr. Good evening, everyone. Welcome back uh, to our lecture series uh, under um, Department of Medicine, DOMAP. Today we have lectures in the endocrinology. Today's lecture will be taken by Dr. Kripa Elizabeth Chirian. She is an associate professor in the Department of Endocrinology at Christian Medical College, Velo. Uh, she is uh, having her areas of interest in metabolic bond disease transplant endocrinology. Um, Dr. Kripa has more than 61 publications in various national and international journals, and she's also reviewed in IGM. Uh, today's Dr. Kripa's lecture topic will be approach to metabolic bone disease. This lecture will soon be uploaded on our Department of Medicine YouTube website. So uh, hopefully all of you will be able to make it for the lecture now and otherwise maybe later on in the website per se. Any doubts through the session, please feel free to ask directly or maybe you can drop down your questions in the chat box. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Kripa, for taking today's lecture and uh, hopefully it will be all very worthwhile for you guys. Thanks a lot. Over to you, Dr. Kripa. Thank you, uh, Dr. Anju, for your kind words of introduction. Uh, we'll begin this uh, session. I'll be taking an approach to metabolic bone disease. Uh, now, contrary to uh, common approaches to various diseases, this will completely be a case-based discussion where I will uh, take you through different presentations of various metabolic bone diseases rather than focus on theoretical and factual statements uh, from textbooks. Uh, so as you know, uh, osteoporosis is one of the most common metabolic bone diseases and untreated osteoporosis may lead to fractures. I will not be covering this in detail because uh, osteoporosis is essentially clinically silent and uh, postmenopausal women and elderly men are recommended to be screened for osteoporosis. Uh, as we know, bone is a dynamic tissue. It's not a dead and silent tissue. It is a living tissue wherein there are osteoblasts. They work towards mineralization through deposition of calcium and phosphate in the osteoid. And this leads to the formation of mineralized bone. There are also osteoclasts that are constantly resorbing bone. So any abnormality in these processes can lead to what we call a metabolic bone disease. Uh, classification of metabolic bone disease, this is not an exhaustive list. So besides osteoporosis, we have what we call the mineralization defects that lead to rickets and osteomalacia. We have a whole lot of sclerotic bone disorders, which may be hereditary, genetic and acquired. We also have developmental disorders and other rare syndromes. So I'll come to the broad heading of rickets and osteomalacia, very common terms that we've been hearing from our school days. What exactly is rickets and osteomalacia? So to put it very simply, these are mineralization defects. And we know that rickets is something that we would associate with children and osteomalacia with adults. So why this difference? So rickets, remember, this consists of abnormal mineralization of the growth plate. We know that children have something known as a growth plate. Uh, this is where uh, accretion of bone occurs, increase in length of bone occurs. Uh, this is present only in children. When the growth plate is not mineralized, that is when rickets occurs, they develop deformities. Whereas osteomalacia is something where the bone matrix is deficient in mineralization. And that is why rickets occurs only in children, whereas osteomalacia can occur both in children and in adults. Rickets never occurs in adults because in adults, the growth plate has fused. So remember that rickets and osteomalacia, the bottom line is defective mineralization. Now, what causes uh, defective mineralization? This can be because of vitamin D deficiency through various causes like inadequate dietary intake, a poor sunlight exposure, any malabsorptive state, or in conditions where vitamin D catabolism is increased, particularly with anti-epileptic <laughs> drugs, cirrhosis and renal failure. It can be a deficient action of vitamin D. Uh, 
uh, either at the hydroxylation level or at the receptor level. Other causes for rickets and osteomalacia would be a hypophosphatemia. This can be because of inadequate dietary absorption or it can be because of excessive leaking from the renal tubules. Other rare causes would be something known as uh, fibrogenesis and osteogenesis imperfecta, hypophosphatasia and axial osteomalacia. So let's go through a few case uh, scenarios. Uh, these are patients who have actually presented to us at various time points. This is the case of an 18 year old boy who presented to us with bone pains, progressive deformity and proximal muscle weakness. Uh, he was born of a consanguineous marriage. His mother also had similar history of bony pains, deformity and proximal muscle weakness. When we examined them, we found that there was bony tenderness, there was significant proximal myopathy and there was uh, bony deformities. So these are the clinical photographs of the boy and his mother on the right side. Uh, if you will see these pictures, uh, you will notice that, yes, there are evident deformities, right? And this is the x-ray of the boy. If you uh, will see, there are these translucent uh, bands on the medial cortex. Uh, these are termed as pseudofractures. So on clinical and radiological examination, uh, what was obvious is that there was a genuvalgum. So this deformity is known as genuvalgum. There was a genuvarum. Uh, this is a genu varum. This deformity of the boy is known as a genu valgum. When there is varum on one side and valgum on the other side, that is known as a windswept deformity. Pseudo fractures were seen on x rays. Uh, these pseudo fractures are also known as loser zones or milkman's lines. These are the hallmarks of an osteomalacia. So, when we went on to biochemical investigations, we found that. Uh, the phosphorus, the fasting phosphorus was low in the boy. The alkaline phosphatase was high. We also looked at something known as uh, TMP-GFR. Uh, I'll give you an analogy. We know that the renal threshold for glucose is 180 milligrams per deciliter, which means that when the blood levels uh, exceed 180 milligrams per deciliter, uh, glucose appears in urine and the tubules are no longer able to reabsorb glucose. Similarly for phosphorus, there is a threshold for phosphate reabsorption. Normally, this should be around 2.5 to 4.5. In certain inherited syndromes like hypophosphatemic rickets, uh, the threshold for phosphate reabsorption is lowered. So this can lead to a renal phosphate leak. And that is what this boy and his mother had. They had something known as a hypophosphatemic rickets. The inheritance pattern in this case was X-linked dominant because that is the most common cause for inherited rickets. And there was an evident renal phosphate leak. So how did we treat this patient? Uh, because the primary defect was in the phosphorus being lost, they require phosphate supplementation through neutral phosphate. They need to be replete uh, in calcium. Vitamin D supplements were also given. In this particular case of uh, rickets and osteomalacia, we also give calcitriol, which is active vitamin D. Uh, how do we monitor these patients? Clinically, we look for improvement in bony pains and their proximal muscle weakness. Biochemically, we look for normalization of alkaline phosphatase. Radiologically, the deformities improve. Because these patients are on active vitamin D, uh, this can lead to increased calcium absorption. There is a risk for hypercalciuria and nephrolithiasis. So on follow-up, the urine calcium needs to be monitored as well. Uh, so this was a case of familial hypophosphatemic rickets. It's very important to take a thorough family history when patients present with uh, rickettic deformities. I'll take you to another case. This is a 32-year-old lady who's known to have a bipolar 
disorder she was referred from psychiatry she was referred because she again had bony pains she had pain in her left lower limb she had difficulty in walking she had a severe proximal myopathy she was on carbamazepine for her bipolar disorder so when we examined her similar to the boy and his mother we found that there was significant proximal myopathy the biochemistry had shown a hypophosphatemia the alkaline phosphatase was high and there were pseudo fractures on the x ray this is the magnified view so this was a case of drug induced osteomalacia so again it is important to keep in mind that there are certain drugs particularly the anti epileptics such as phenytoin phenobarbitone and carbamazepine which can interfere with vitamin d metabolism and lead to osteomalacia so whenever a patient presents again with similar history take a thorough drug history if a patient is on phenytoin or carbamazepine empirically you might uh, want to start on vitamin d supplements so that they don't present with uh, such symptoms other drugs are the antiretroviral agents and anti tb drugs like rifampicin and pyrazinamide another case is of a 17 year old girl she presented with generalized bony pains and proximal muscle weakness contrary to the previous two cases she also had three episodes of acute quadriparesis on further probing she gave history of sicker symptoms such as dry mouth dry eyes and also joint pains on clinical examination there was proximal myopathy and bony tenderness her ultrasound had shown a uh, nephrocalcinosis which is calcification of the renal parenchyma and her urine amino acids was positive which means that she had generalized amino acid urea so these were the investigations so again similar to the previous patients that i presented there is a hypophosphatemia there is an alkaline phosphatase and in the setting that she came to us with bony pains and proximal myopathy this is sufficient to diagnose an osteomalacia but uh, if you remember she also gave additional history of quadriparesis uh, she also had sicker symptoms with joint pains so it's important to go further into a little more work up we found that she had hypokalemia she we found that she had an acidosis so this lady had osteomalacia with hypokalemia and a mixed pattern of renal tubular acidosis uh, she had a jogren syndrome on further workup so etiological workup of osteomalacia is mandatory jogren syndrome can cause a uh, distal renal tubular acidosis uh, it phosphate and potassium leak uh, it needs to be treated with sodium bicarbonate potassium supplements as well as active vitamin d so remember again that sjogren syndrome is not just about sicka symptoms and joint pains it can also affect the tubules so profoundly that the patients can actually present with osteomalacia so this is the initial x ray of the patient where she presented with pseudo fractures which have healed satisfactorily following treatment again another interesting case of osteomalacia this time uh, there were three silver smiths who came to us they were working in west bengal and closely affiliated to the silver industry and many times this has been passed on from generations their father their grandfather would have been silver smiths and they take apprenticeship under them and continue the profession so these three gentlemen Uh, had presented to us again with bony pains uh, and proximal myopathy so uh, this is the picture of them at work you can see the beautiful silver jewelry and ornaments that they are busy making so here when we did a heavy metal analysis we found that they had toxic levels of cadmium which again can cause a renal tubular acidosis a phosphate leak and osteomalacia so it is again important on history to take a thorough occupational history what is the occupation 
uh, we have had almost 15 to 20 uh, of such silversmiths who present to us. Uh, this management is symptomatic. Ideally, they should be asked to change their profession, but some of our patients were willing to do so, but some of them sadly continue in the same profession and nothing much can be done. There are chelating agents that are available like bar, but in this particular case, our patients were not willing for that. They were treated supportively and symptomatically. Their symptoms definitely improved. Two of them actually changed their occupation as well. So this was a case of cadmium related renal tubular acidosis and hypophosphatemic osteomalacia. So uh, to conclude the uh, part on rickets and osteomalacia, these are mineralization defects. Patients, how do they present to you? They will present with bony pains. They will present with proximal myopathy. Investigations, when you do a bone mineral profile, you, fi you find that the fasting phosphorus is low. The alkaline phosphatase is high. X-rays of relevant regions need to be done. And besides all this, pay careful attention to patient symptomatology, a thorough family history, take a thorough drug history and go into detail on the occupation of the patient. So uh, we'll move on to the next case, which is a little different. Uh, this time they were siblings, a brother and a sister, 64 year old lady and a 57 year old gentleman who presented to us with low backache. This was non-inflammatory. There was no history of trauma. When we examined the patient, the sister particularly, we found that she had an abnormally large head with a head circumference as high as 68 centimeters. She also had a bilateral sensory neural hearing loss. Rest of the systemic examination was normal. The brother had actually accompanied the sister he also had an abnormally large head with a head circumference of 62 centimeters and bilateral hearing loss. On further inquiry, he also gave history that yes, he also had been having similar low backache. So this was a pair of siblings who presented with bony pains, macrocephaly and hearing loss. When we went further into the biochemistry of both the siblings, what actually struck us was the very high levels of alkaline phosphatase as high as 1000 in the brother and 400 in the sister. Now, whenever a male patient presents with a uh, low backache, uh, particularly he is around 60 years old, low backache, a high alkaline phosphatase, it's very important that we rule out a metastatic malignancy. Commonly in males, a prostate malignancy can cause sclerotic metastasis. And that is why we did the PSA, which was actually normal. When we proceeded with radiology of the pelvis and the skull, we found that both in the brother and the sister, they had the sclerotic lytic patterns on the X-ray. And with the background of elevated alkaline phosphatase and the symptomatology, we proceeded with what is known as a bone scan. And this showed intense tracer uptake in the axial skeleton, if you will notice, in the pelvis and the skull. So this was a case of polyostotic Paget's disease of the bone. Uh, both patients were treated with bisphosphonates, zolindronic acid and calcium and vitamin D supplements. On follow-up over two years, both demonstrated significant improvement. So this uh, case was uh, because it was a rare presentation. This was published as a case report. So what exactly is Paget's disease? This is characterized by excessive osteoclastic bone resorption. And to keep up with that, there is excessive bone formation as well. And because this occurs at a rapid uh, accelerated rate, the new bone is deposited in a disorganized and mosaic fashion. Because there is high osteoclastic and osteoblastic activity, this is what is responsible for the sclerotic and lytic mixed pattern that we see on x-rays. Uh, there is evidence to suggest some genetic basis 
of this condition in the sequestrosome gene. Uh, some studies have also shown the presence of the paramyxovirus uh, nucleic acid inside the osteoclast. So this also has been suggested as a potential etiological factor. On histopathology, what is characteristic is the mosaic pattern of bone deposition, irregular cement lines and increased osteoclastic activity, particularly on the edges. So this was a case of Paget's disease. Again, uh, the diagnosis of Paget's disease requires a high index of suspicion. They present again with bony pains. Other features would be a hearing loss, macrocephaly. They can present with fractures. Uh, they can present with cranial nerve uh, palsies. Whenever a male patient presents with bony pains, it is important to rule out osteoblastic metastasis. How do you diagnose this condition? With the high alkaline phosphatase, characteristic appearance on x-rays and intense tracer uptake on the bone scan, particularly in the axial skeleton. How do we treat with bisphosphonates? Sometimes more than one dose of parenteral bisphosphonates would be required. And how do we monitor disease activity? This requires serial estimation of alkaline phosphatase which should come down to the normal range. Over the past one decade, we've had uh, more than 48 patients and most of them are in remission. Again, another different uh, case of a 23-year-old gentleman who presented with an alleged fall from standing height. So when we talk about standing height and a fall from standing height, remember that the uh, the veloc the trauma is not a high velocity trauma. Okay, it's a trivial trauma. And following this, he had pain in his left leg, which was evaluated. He was detected to have a fracture. He was conservatively managed for the fracture with a POP application. But after two months, he continued to have pain. He had difficulty in walking. He also had a proximal myopathy. On further inquiry, he gave history of recurrent renal calculi in the past. So let's go through his uh, investigation. So what is striking is the very high levels of calcium in this patient as high as 15 milligram per deciliter with a low phosphorus. Uh, we again further investigated and found that his parathormone levels were also high, more than 1000, high alkaline phosphatase, his 24-hour urine calcium indicated that he had a hypercalciuria. So this gentleman who sustained fracture following fall from standing height, progressive difficulty in walking, proximal myopathy with a high calcium and a high PTH. This is known as a PTH-dependent hypercalcemia. This gentleman had what is known as a primary hyperparathyroidism. So when patients present with hypercalcemia, what uh, most cases are due to malignancy or primary hyperparathyroidism, but it is essential to go through this list and rule out other causes. Uh, the acronym is vitamins TRAP, V for vitamin A and D toxicity, I for immobilization, thyrotoxicosis, Addison's, milk alkali syndrome, inflammatory disorders, neoplastic related, S for sarcoidosis, and TRAP, T stands for thiazides, uh, lithium is another cause, rhabdomyolysis, AIDS, and P for Paget's disease, rarely, uh, parenteral nutrition occasionally, rarely in pheochromocytoma, and diseases of the parathyroid, wherein you have a primary hyperparathyroidism. So uh, why is it important to identify this? Further workup uh, showed that this scan on the left, similar to the bone scan, this is again a nuclear scan specific for the parathyroid known as a sestam AB scan. This has shown this increased trace sestam AB uptake in the neck, if you will see. This was the parathyroid adenoma, which was also present on ultrasound. He underwent a surgery and this fracture that was there 
progressively improved following surgery so here you will notice that his bone is almost uh, disappearing but after surgery uh, this is 6 months and this is at one year follow up you can see that the bone has reformed so uh, after curative parathyroidectomy he had some significant symptomatic and radiological improvement so primary hyperparathyroidism is characterized by painful bones renal stones abdominal groans psychic moans and fatigue overtones uh, we would have studied this in our undergraduate class this is known as the albright pentad uh, another case this again is a 32 year old lady who presented with hip pain and decreased mobility of 6 months duration there was no muscle weakness in this case on examination there was tenderness of the left hip movements were restricted most of the blood bone biochemistry was normal except for a high alkaline phosphatase when we did a pelvic x ray uh, this is where she had the pain uh, if you will notice the femur is almost bent there is a little fracture over here and this is analogous to this uh, instrument okay this is known this is something that the shepherds use you know while tending to their sheep and therefore this deformity is known as the shepherd's crook deformity it is characteristic of what is known as fibrous dysplasia of the bone so this is bones the bone scan which showed an increased uptake at that site so what is fibrous dysplasia this is a sporadic condition uh, it occurs due to a constitutive activating mutation of this particular locus on chromosome on the long arm of chromosome 20 now this uh, particular locus it codes for something known as the alpha subunit of the uh, g protein coupled receptor so when there is a mutation in this particular locus what happens is that the receptor uh, keeps on signaling even without any ligand binding to this receptor uh, it keeps on signaling and that is known as a constitutive activating mutation and that is what leads to these dysplastic lesions in the bone it presents with deformity pain and fractures rarely this condition that is fibrous dysplasia can occur as part of a syndrome known as the mccune albright syndrome which i will come to so how do we treat fibrous dysplasia again with parenteral or oral bisphosphonates uh management involves a multidisciplinary team team because when there are deformities that needs to be attended to by the orthopedic surgeon particularly when there is a shepherd's crook deformity it might require osteotomies uh, intramedullary nailing and cross pinning of the neck bisphosphonates help in reducing pain and bone turnover it definitely does improve the quality of life in most of the patients i'll come to mccune albright syndrome this is again uh, a young lady who presented a couple of years back with pain in her right lower limb she also complained of decreased vision another significant history was that she had attained menarche at 7 years of age when we examined the patient we found these lesions all right so these are known as cafe au lait macules uh she uh, very strangely we found that she had a coarse facies she had acral enlargement as well so uh, when we further investigated her we found that in addition to the active bone disease that she had she had what is known as acromegaly with high growth hormone levels she had high prolactin levels as high as 3000 normal is up to 25 in females she had a suppressed tsh and subclinical hyperthyroidism and there was history of precocious puberty so these were the characteristic dysplastic lesions on the bone uh, that she had this is the nuclear scan showing increased tracer uptake in these sites Uh, this again is an iodine scan which show which is showing a hyperactive uh, two hyperactive nodules in the thyroid gland 
and i said that she had high prolactin levels she had acral enlargement she had high uh, growth hormone levels uh, she also had decrease in vision and that is why we had done uh, an mri which showed a large pituitary macro adenoma so sometimes fibrous dysplasia is not as innocuous as it looks uh, we need to look for syndromic associations when you examine the patient look for evidence of any cafe au lait macules does the patient have any acral enlargement what about the menstrual cycles of the patient is there any precocious puberty or are there irregular cycles now is there galactoria to suggest a prolactin elevation is there any clinical evidence of thyroid hormone excess all these needs to be looked into on a thorough history taking so mccun albright syndrome the classic triad we've been taught is precocious puberty cafe au lait skin lesions and a polyostotic fibrous dysplasia in addition to this classic triad there can be endocrine hyperfunction that may result in acromegaly thyrotoxicosis rarely cushing syndrome and uh, something known as a tumor induced osteomalacia treatment apart from the bone lesions uh, it is directed at the underlying endocrinopathies our particular patient was given bisphosphonates with which she had symptomatic improvement uh, she will undergo an iodine ablation for her hyperthyroidism and for the prolactin and growth hormone excess at present she is on cabagolin and she might uh, undergo surgery later when she comes for follow up so uh, we'll go into another section of sclerotic bone dysplasia so sclerotic bone dysplasia essentially means that there is sclerosis of the bone there are many causes some of the hereditary causes are osteopetrosis which we might be familiar with other not so common causes are what we call pycnodysostosis osteopoikilosis camurati engelmann disease uh, osteopathy striata so essentially all this represents some kind of disruption in the bone ossification pathway leading to dense and sclerotic bones there are also other non hereditary conditions such as a meloriostosis there are also acquired causes like osteoplastic metastasis remember the brother who had presented with pages disease we had actually looked for whether he had any evidence of malignancy skeletal fluorosis is another uh, acquired cause for a sclerotic bone disease so i'll take you through a couple of cases that we've had uh, this was a 31 year old gentleman who presented with pain and stiffness of the lower limbs for 5 years his bone biochemistry was normal when we proceeded with the x rays of the involved side the femur and the tibia this is what we found i'm sure you'll all agree with me that the bones are definitely thick and sclerotic but it is important to see the kind or the pattern of sclerosis uh, in the involved bones so one look at it uh, it seems that the sclerosis is sort of flowing along the bone so that is what we know that what that is what we call a flowing hyperostosis this has a candle wax appearance and this is characteristic of meloriostosis another example this time a 47 year old lady who presented with pain in her lower back hip and lower limbs uh, bone biochemistry again was normal other clinical examination was unremarkable except for this tenderness over her lower limb spine and hip so uh, these were her x ray striations in the bone right in the lumbar vertebrae in the bones of the lower limbs and in the bones of the uh, ilio ilial region and the sacrum so this is uh, what we known as Uh, what we call as an osteopathia striata that this patient had again another case of a 32 year old lady who again presented with pain in her hip and knee joints uh, when we got an x ray done this is what we saw in the x ray of the pelvis 
so what is obvious and what is evident are the spots in the bone right so this is what we call us call as spotted bone disease or osteofoiculosis another sclerotic bone disease another case of a 39 year old lady she was from jharkhand uh, she presented with bony pains that were progressively worsening leading to a difficulty with ambulation there was no significant family history no prior fractures or falls clinical examination revealed an antalgic gait her bone biochemistry was strangely normal so this is what we found on her x-rays uh, you will agree with me again i'm sure that the bones appear sclerotic she seems to have a fracture over here the lumbar the x-ray of the lumbar sacral lumbar sacral spine also looks sclerotic and dense uh, again when we went into her history we found that she was consuming water from a bore well near her house so we proceeded with an x-ray of the forearm which showed this characteristic interosseous membrane calcification and this is diagnostic of fluorosis her urine fluoride was also well above the permissible cutoff of 1 parts per million hers was 2.8 and this lady had what is known as fluorosis so sclerotic bone diseases also you might come across in your opd this has a variety of radiographic appearances and clinical findings there can be both hereditary and acquired sclerotic sclerosing bone disorders many of these conditions like the diseases that i that i presented uh, there is no definitive treatment nothing to reverse this condition what we can offer is only symptomatic management for the pain and making sure that they are calcium and vitamin d replete so uh, to conclude my talk osteoporosis is one of the most common of the metabolic bone uh, disorders but there is a whole spectrum of metabolic bone diseases beyond osteoporosis rickets and osteomalacia here history is very important uh, particularly family history history of other underlying conditions like uh, sjogren syndrome uh, exposure to particular drugs and uh, take into account the occupation of the patient rickets and osteomalacia they present with bony pains they present with deformity and there is proximal myopathy bone biochemistry will show hypophosphatemia in case of hypophosphatemic osteomalacia sometimes the underlying cause is a vitamin d deficiency the alkaline phosphatase is high it is important to take a thorough history and do a complete clinical examination most of the other disorders present with bony pains what will probably distinguish them is the bone biochemistry and subsequent tests that are dictated by the symptomatology of the patient like for example characteristic appearance on x-rays in case of pagets disease uh, increased tracer uptake in the involved axial skeleton on bone scan for pagets disease uh, fibrous dysplasia you might have the characteristic shepherd's crook deformity look for syndromic associations and uh, sclerotic bone diseases unfortunately many of them uh, don't have a particular treatment treatment is usually mostly supportive and symptomatic thank you thanks lord dr kripa that was very much very uh, detailed and very much clarified clear picture which has been given about uh, an approach to metabolic bone disease per se uh is there any questions uh you can put down the chat box there is one question meant by someone who's was coming that saying excellent presentation and also um wanted to know uh, whether on next question is fluorosis common in south india it is common we have seen occasionally uh, cases particularly from uh, the andhra belt commonly we see uh, more towards east we've had patients from bihar jharkhand presenting with uh, fluorosis as a question asking what's the younger stage of macular nerve syndrome not common across 
Yeah, so Mecunolbright syndrome, uh, so we deal with adult endocrinology, so pediatric cases usually don't uh, come to our attention, but uh, they can present as early as the first decade of life. Uh, we've had, uh, we've seen children who've, who have presented with uh, bleeding per vaginum as early as two years of age, sometimes even less. So precocious puberty is a common manifestation. Also, the cafe au lait macules are seen very early and this can be looked for in uh, patients. Another question is, uh, what is the significance of PINP in bone diseases? P1NP. Yeah, so P1NP uh, is actually a bone formation marker. Usually we use the bone turnover markers commonly uh, in relation to osteoporosis, particularly when we treat osteoporosis, we have... Uh, we usually treat to targets. We have uh, the CTX and P1NP should come down to a particular target range. Uh, as far as other metabolic bone disorders are concerned, uh, for monitoring treatment, bone turnover markers may be used. So how well the patient has responded to bisphosphonates. So this is told by the bone resorption marker CTX. When the CTX or the bone resorption marker comes down, we know that bone formation and bone resorption are coupled. So when the bone resorption comes down, gradually there is a reduction in bone formation and this is reflected in the bone formation marker P1 and P. We're doing it in CMC. We are doing it in CMC, yes. How common is that Jogren syndrome? So Jogren syndrome, again, from our perspective, uh, a pure Sjogren syndrome is managed under rheumatology commonly, but we do have uh, patients who present to us with features of osteomalacia, hypokalemia. Uh, sometimes when we do an etiological workup, that is when we find that the patient has an underlying Sjogren syndrome. Uh, Dr. Krupa, will you be able to just tell us about a little bit of approach on a CKD-based uh, metabolic bone disease in a patient with presence of chronic kidney disease? Yeah. Like the spectrum of bone disease, which can be like from an adenomic bone disease to having an in loss to dystrophy. Yeah, so chronic uh, chronic kidney disease, the bone disease uh, varies along a, a wide spectrum, actually. So currently with management of secondary hyperparathyroidism in uh, chronic kidney disease, particularly with the use of excess uh, calcitriol and active vitamin D supplements, patients, uh, many patients we see they have an adynamic bone uh, disease. Uh, we manage symptomatically usually. If the patient has severe osteoporosis and an underlying CKD uh, treatment agents like the bisphosphonates are usually contraindicated. Uh, what is safe in renal failure is something known as denosumab, which may be given to, it is a monoclonal antibody against the rankle. And uh, this can be used to suppress uh, the bone resorption. Uh, adynamic bone, usually uh, what we do is we try and keep the active vitamin D to the lowest possible uh, dose. Uh, currently, teriparatide and CKD, there, there are few studies using small numbers of patients, but currently there is no evidence to use teriparatide in an adynamic bone disease. Is there a way of classifying based on the amount of pH, the level of pH? to say that you go about treating the endomium bone this is a target for bone disease uh, giving calcium supplements and yeah so the pts targets are what is already established for ckd stages three to five uh, we don't go by a pth target to treat the bone disease this uh and then uh, diagnosis per se will be based on uh yes based on the bone biochemistry the alkaline phosphatase yes there's one more question. Uh, there's a comment uh, saying, interesting case of bipolar disorder with drug-induced vitamin D deficiency. Can it be other way too, as in severe vitamin deficiency as a cause? Uh, very unlikely, uh, because carbamazepine is known to interfere with the hydroxylation of uh, vitamin D. So this particular patient has had very low vitamin D and uh, the temporal profile of the patient was bipolar disorder first, initiation of carbamazepine and then presentation with uh, symptoms of osteomalacia. So very unlikely that it was otherwise. 
uh, whenever a patient is on anti-epileptics, particularly phenytoin and carbamazepine, uh, do a bone biochemistry and make sure they, that they are empirically initiated on uh, vitamin D supplements. I think that answers to the comment added further, saying that can vitamin D deficiency per se can have presentations in terms of depression, anxiety, and having infant death. So, like how Dr. Kripa has mentioned, the terminal profile kind of fits in for the other way around, like yes, how she yes. has presented. Any further questions? There was actually a very excellent presentation and a very good approach on on a PG basis. I think it was quite useful for whoever attended and anyone who is further willing to attend, wish to attend can be uh, can access this lecture in our Department of YouTube uh, web Medicine website in YouTube. Uh, I think we'll wind up for today. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Kripa again for that excellent presentation. Um, thanks to all. Bye. Thank you.